You see, there's that still. He's got that go in him. Loss. Bring it close again. Loss. Good. Good boy. Fetch. Place. Good. Sit. Now I tell him he must let go. Loss. Fetch. Sit. Good. Loss. Now I call him back to me without the ball. Mace. Bo. Sit. So one thing, guys, that people were asking me um, was kind of exactly how it went down, how it happened, what did the handler do, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason I'm going to share this information is, A, because I don't think it makes the handler look bad at all, because I don't think I could have done better in his situation. B, because I think maybe we can all learn something from it. Anyways, as I had mentioned previously, the dog been with the handler for a little bit. They've been getting along for a few months. They've been doing things together, living life together. Fundamentally, what happened was Mace and the handler were hanging out together in his workshop. I've been there. It's a nice place. And uh, the kennels are also there. So they were hanging out together and Mace was just kind of moseying around the workshop and the handler was doing whatever he was doing. Long story short, he hears Mace growling. He turns around, looking around to see what the dog's growling at because he thought maybe somebody was coming in or something like that. And he realizes that the dog is growling at him. So he looked at the dog and he said, no. And the dog came up to him and jumped on him. He pushed the dog off. And at that point, he saw that the dog was coming for him. He fed the dog his forearm. And when the dog grabbed his forearm, he grabbed the dog by the, uh, the neck because he was trying to grab the collar on the dog. And when he grabbed him by the neck, luckily the dog did pop off. And he was able to walk the dog into the kennel and push him into the kennel, close the door. You know, he said that the dog was still acting a little nasty towards him um, as he was doing that. I told him, number one, you kept your cool. When a dog comes for you, especially a dog like Mace, it is extremely difficult to keep your cool. I was very, very impressed by that. And again, knowing the guy, I'm not surprised. Number two, if it was over going into the kennel, the dog didn't get his way. Even though you ended up, you know, obviously uh, having an unfortunate trip to the hospital, the dog didn't get his way and you actually technically won that one, even though you really lost. But in, in the dog's mind, from the dog's perspective, if we're right that it was in fact over going into the kennel, he technically won uh, because the dog ended up in the kennel. The other thing that I thought was very good was that the dog came off when he grabbed the dog by the neck, which means that the dog had second thoughts because if you are ever doing bite work with Mace and you grab him by the neck, he will not come off. <laughs> you know, he'll, he'll bite you harder. And the fact that he did shows that he did have some reservations about what he was doing. You know, a lot of people, oh, this training, that, this, everybody's got an opinion. Very few people actually ever work with dogs like this. And when you work with dogs like this, you know it's par for the course. This is why I've said it before, I'll say it again, I do not sell, typically, dogs like this to the general public because this is the reality of dealing with dogs like this. They're dogs that people tell stories about. They're dogs that are exciting and, and really, you know, the type of dogs that you don't ever forget about, whether you're the handler, the trainer, or whatever else. But they're not the good dogs to generally sell to people because they're dogs like this. And I made it very, very clear when I initially sold the dog that this is not your average dog. This is a very, very different kind of dog. And, you know, as, as interesting as they are to work with, they're generally not the type of dog that we deal in or that we sell. The vast majority of our clients are families that are looking for a nice protection dog, a beautiful dog that, that is going to provide protection for their family that is well-trained. You know, Mace is a beautiful dog and he's as well-trained as uh, Mace is going to be, but he's definitely not a dog for a family. And a big part of selling dogs to families is not just the training, it's selecting the right dogs and the, the, the right temperament and the right breed for that specific family. That's something that we are quite good at here and that's something we take a, a lot of pride and care in, in doing properly. But again, you know, these primal dogs like Mace are, are still dogs that we make it our business to be involved in the training of because I think as trainers and as people that are generally connoisseurs of the working dog, it makes us better in all regards. So, you know, as unfortunate as it is, it's definitely not altogether unforeseen. Again, guys, I would like to really reiterate that the handler, in my opinion, when this occurred, he handled this in the best way possible. I mean, think about what a G you have to be that 
you see this monster coming for you and say, all right, I'm going to feed him my forearm because this is the, you know, probably the safest part of me to bite, right? The dog is a bicep dog. So if he grabs you by the bicep, he's going to rip your bicep off, right? If he grabs you by any other part of your body, the, the potential damage is going to be very, very severe. And, and he's going to maybe disable you in that moment. Instead, forearm, and then utilize his other hand to get control of the dog and uh, put the dog in a place where neither he or the dog would be hurt any further. And again, I, people don't like to hear it. People want to scream up and down that it's not true, but anybody that really works these dogs know it's very common. Dutch Shepherds, Mallies, tons of handler aggression for tons of different reasons, whether it's in life, whether it's in training. That's just uh, one of the risks that you run when you play with those types of dogs. One of my daily sessions here with Mace. When you have a dog like this, you have to work him every day. You have to make a structured life for a dog like this. Boch. You have to understand what you're looking at when you're dealing with him. Are you looking at drive? Are you looking at excitement? Are you looking at arousal? Are you looking at uh, the dog shit testing you for lack of a better word? Dogs like this, even though he's generally a good natured dog, will do small things to determine what kind of person you are in the relationship. And if he finds a chink in your armor, if he finds a weakness, that's something that he might exploit at a later point in the future. And a big part sit, of maintaining stability with dogs like this that have so much drive, arousal, dominance, a big part of it is keeping them busy in work and holding them accountable to the rules in work. A lot of people think, you know, when things go south with dogs like this, it's because the work made the dog go south. And usually it's the opposite. It's a lack of work. And with other dogs like him, which we've trained many, sit. It's actually the pressure, the consistent application of training that involves both consequence and reward that keeps him in that stable mindset, that keeps him so obedient, that keeps him working well, that actually makes the dog happy because it's clear boundaries. Right? He doesn't have to think about anything. Everything's always laid out for him. And that structure keeps the brain calm. It keeps the dog in a state that is mentally and physically healthy. And it keeps the dog from becoming too neurotic. Sit. A lot of people think that you take a dog like this and you just give him love and you play with him and you cuddle with him in the bed and you give him treats and you give him his ball and he's going to love you. Well, it's true that if you do that, he might love you. Most likely, he'll just treat you like a, a, a trick, for lack of a better word, because that's functionally what you are. All you're doing is just giving him bribery, bribery, bribery. The dog will never respect you. And when a dog like this doesn't respect you, then you're in danger. Because if you ever get between him and something he wants, or if he decides he wants you, then there's nothing stopping him from ever doing that. Now, as you guys may or may not know, this dog did unfortunately have an incident where he was aggressive with his handler and uh, he put a few holes in his arm. And this was in life that this happened. And when I say in life, I mean they weren't training at all. They were just hanging out. And I actually think now, based on the couple of weeks that I've spent with the dog, that that might be the problem. When I hang out with Mace, when I take him for walks in the woods and we do things like this with each other, he does a lot of micro behaviors. They seem harmless and they seem kind of like you know, he's just being fun, but they're also small tests of his position in relation to you. When you have a dog like this that's full of power and dominance, a lot of the time these dogs will always, like I said before, shit test you a little bit. Mace, if you are not prepared for it, and if you've allowed a lot of small things to go, which I'm not saying that's what the handler did, I actually don't know. Like certain things, like when we walk in the woods together, and we've been going on a few walks in the woods together, you know, he'll run up to you and he'll give you like a little bump, you know, he'll jump up on you a little bit, and it's all like, you know, he's acting like it's a fun game. But if you know a little bit about it, it's a fun game, but it's also kind of a little bit of a dominance game. Yeah. Sit. Look. The problem with this, is those small things are, those small little moments are reducing the inhibition that the dog has. So if I allow those behaviors to go unchecked, now I'm reducing his inhibition towards being physical with me. And that physicality may be good natured at the time, kind of like boys wrestling, but with a dog like him, it's very important to not blur those lines. And the problem with a dog like Mace is he sucks you in. Look at him, look at his eyes, look at his body language. He's a playful, big, you know, goof but there's also that other side there, right? And if something trips that other side and you have this kind of, we're just buddies relationship, I don't think 
you're going to be in as good a position as if, no, I'm your daddy and you listen to me. So you'll see me often doing a lot of behaviors with this dog, like I make him do a lot of things. Sit. Place. Sit. Off. Sit. Now look at this. One thing he always likes to do is body check me on the way back. So I'm going to step into him. Mace. No. Yeah. <laughs> if I don't offer him something, he'll hammer me on the recall. Place. So these repetitive exercises that I make him do are good for his mental health. Um, they give him something to occupy his brain. And also, what I'm constantly reinforcing with this dog is impulse control. And with a dog like this, we already talked about it when he first came, he has zero impulse control. The more impulse you control you can put on a dog like this, the more respect he'll have for you and the safer he'll be to handle. Now, it's still Mace. You're not going to change, like, fundamentally who he is, but you have more things to work with when you have real impulse control, when you have real obedience with a dog like this. So now he sees the ball, he wants the ball, and now I make him come to me instead of the ball. Mace! He wants the ball, but now I'm going to make him go to the bed. Place. Good. Now I'm going to make him take the ball, and then I want him to go back to the bed. Let's see if we can do that. He might try to come to me. We'll see. Fetch. Place. Good. Sit. Now I tell him he must let go. Los. Fetch. Sit. Good. Los. Now I call him back to me without the ball. Mace. Vo. Seat. He's not going to take the food. It's not a problem. Fetch. Mace. Vo. Seat. Good. <laughs> Seat. Accidentally on purpose letting go of the ball. Now I'm going to tell him to go and collect the ball. Yeah. Los. Af. Fetch. Af. Good. Los. Fetch. Zit. Place. Zit. You see, I'm just mixing and matching the behaviors. We're putting it all together. We're mixing it up, right? Constantly making the dog do different things, keeping his mind active, forcing him to use what's in between his ears for more than just satisfying his own instincts and impulses. Mace. Vo. Good boy. That's nice, man. Good. Los. Vo. Fetch. Zit. 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 Oh. Zit. Good. Fetch. Seat. Good. Good. Look. That's my boy. Good job, man. Place. No. Place. Good. Again, just playing with his mind a little bit, forcing him to think. Af. Af. And when he makes mistakes, I make pressure. And when I make pressure, it becomes imperative that he listens. And these are the kinds of things that dogs like this need. Otherwise, they become neurotic, they become unstable, they become crazy. All right, guys, so I did mention that I think I might know what happened. Now, I'm going to guess here, and the handler told me a couple of things that happened prior to the dog going after him. And one of the things was that he was getting ready to put the dog back in the kennel. He hadn't gone to get the dog, but, you know, he had done a few things that he always does before he puts the dog back in the kennel. And the only time I've personally seen Mace show me a different body language is when I am putting him in the kennel, he is showing me a very different body language than he normally shows me. He hasn't done anything, but I can see where that might be causing some conflict. And believe it or not, I've actually run into a, quite a few Dutch Shepherds that don't like going back into the kennel, um, you know, and will definitely become nasty over going back into the kennel. So that's something to keep in mind, I think, you know, and the handler was saying the same thing. It might have been that the dog knew he was going to go back into the kennel, and that's what caused the issue. But regardless, if we have a dog that we're keeping in a state of balance, stability, uh, work, 
you know, I think it's still less likely that this happens. It's not impossible. And I could be completely wrong. It could be something completely different that sets this dog off. But you know, everybody's always an expert online. Oh, something must have happened. This happened. The dog remembered. People are so silly with this type of stuff. You know, dogs generally will not hold, especially a dog like Mace, they don't hold grudges and, oh, you know, like three weeks ago he said no to me, so now I'm going to get him. That's not how he operates. That's not how he thinks. It's not realistic. That's just not how it works. You know, it's more action reaction. And if the dog has a problem with something you're doing, he will address it at that time. He's not going to wait two weeks later to get you while you aren't paying attention. Attention. It's just not the way it works. I think it might have been over going back in the kennel. Um, I think maybe too much of a buddy-buddy relationship and not enough work that promoted a lot of impulse control for the dog. And again, I can totally see how this dog would suck you into a buddy-buddy relationship. And I would totally understand why most people would be like, hey, that's like what I want to do with the dog. But I think this dog maybe it's better to have more of a business relationship with him. I think that actually works better for a dog like this. Anyways, that's where I'm at now mentally, just with you know having worked with him a little bit and seeing kind of where he's at mentally and, and training with him. Like I'm not seeing any problems with the training. Like I'm not seeing like, oh, all of a sudden, you know, he's having problems with pressure. He's having problem with a raised voice or anything like that. I see a dog that, you know, is still very willing to work, um, still relatively safe in the work, as long as you know what you're doing, but the issue happened in life. And when issues happen in life, then you have to be very, very careful, right? There's a lot of dogs that the issues will only happen in work because there was some messed up stuff in training or whatever else, or the dog had bad experiences in the past, or maybe the dog just has some bad predispositions. But when it happens in life, and that's what you see with a lot of these more dominant dogs, is in the work, the handlers obviously always on their game, they know what to do, they have their tools, they're ready to rock and roll, and they're you know a step ahead of the dog. But in life, we all relax. We're all down uh, a little bit in our awareness. We're just living, you know? And with dogs like this, you know, sometimes maybe a more of a business relationship is required and, and less of a just, hey, we're, we're friends all the time relationship. And I know, I understand the draw of it, you know? It's, it's always promoted like, hey, you know, just be buddies with this dog and he's just gonna love you and you're gonna love him and it's gonna be this magical thing and you guys are gonna go skipping off into the sunset. But that's not realistic, especially with dogs that are wired this way. Generally, it doesn't work very well and that's the kind of thing that happens. So, you know, I, I never personally, and due disclosure, I never thought that the dog would do that in life once he knew the handler, but you know, he is a Dutchie. And I guess he's gonna do what Dutchies do. At the end of the day, we have to always remember, you know, what kind of dog we're dealing with, regardless of how he presents himself. You know, we take it as a lesson learned and uh, we just try to be smart about it. Again, I could be completely wrong and I accept that as well. What we're gonna do now with this dog is, I'm not giving him bites right now. I'm working on just control and impulse control. And obviously the thing that he's most excited for is protection work. The last little bit, all I've been doing with him is impulse control work. I'm not letting him just go and blow his top and do a whole bunch of bite work. I think that's a mistake with a dog like this. First, he must show really strong impulse control. Then I will give him bite work, but it's not just gonna be like a free for all. Come closer now and just start hitting the sleeve. Sit, 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 sit. Good, again, hitting the sleeve. Good, 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 good. Come closer now. Loss, good. Sit. Voch. Sit. Good. Sit, 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 good. There. Impulse control, he must have a lot of it. Bring that sleeve again close to his face, hit the sleeve a little bit, push it to his mouth, loss. Good boy, good job. Off, off, good. And then bring the sleeve back again, low to his face, loss. Good boy, Superman, good job. Off, good. Come close and then back away sudden. Thus, uh, exactly. Now we add, we add the sudden movements. You can just yell and jump back. Loss, loss, loss. Good, good boy. Sit, sit. And you can see now the dog knows he must not do it 
but he's, now he's like, okay, I go to the handler. No, no, you stay right where you're at. Sit, sit. And that's all his reaction because he wants to go, so he's offering an alternate behavior because he knows he must not go, so he says, maybe I lie down or do this or do that. There's a, I actually have not corrected him on any of these. If you think you're gonna beat a dog like this into listening to you, good luck. See it? When you're working dogs like this, you have to make pressure very meaningful. <laughs> sit, sit. Same again, that's the one he hates. Yeah. That, hates that, that like prey it. movement away, he really hates it. Sit, and now close, and then away. Sit, 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 good, <laughs> sit. Good boy! Again, I have to control his mouth in every aspect. Sit, good seat, good boy, seat, good job. Super work, Mace. Seat, yell a little bit, sit, sit, sit. Again, close. Good boy, good boy. Yell again. Good, bring the sleeve close. You see how tired he's getting? These impulse control exercises are so important for a dog like this. You must control his mind. He's still too free right now. And for a dog like this, that he has done what he did, I'm gonna be so, so firm about impulse control, even more than in the past. Good, bring the sleeve close. Lush. Good job. Good job. You see, there's that still, he's got that go in him. Loss. Bring it close again. Loss. You can walk in a bit. He can't get you. Well, he can get the sleeve. Get the sleeve. That's, that's, all, that's the whole point. I know. I've never felt the dog compress the chomp like that. Oh, he bites like a motherfucker. Loss. Good boy. Good. Loss. Good boy. Tough motherfucker that you are, eh? Good. Good. Wait there now. Good job. Good boy. Good boy. Good. He must present. He must prevent himself. Too many people always prevent the dog. He must prevent himself. Otherwise, he's not exercising impulse control. Otherwise, he's more dangerous and he's capable of doing a lot more bad things. The more impulse control, the more he becomes used to self-regulation and complying with the handler's requests and or commands, the safer this dog is going to be. Bring the sleeve, loss, good job. Good, loss, good. You see, he has it in him a little bit. Good boy! This is what we're doing today. And we're gonna be doing things like this for a little bit and really building strong, strong impulse control. This dog is used to when he sees bite equipment. And the last time we had him, when we would do bite work, of course we made impulse control, but not like this. I didn't push him this hard for impulse control. But now knowing what he did, I have to be more firm on the impulse control. See it? It's, it's the only way forward, right? If he's super dangerous, what's he gonna end up with? He's gonna end up with the blue juice. And the way to reduce the danger with dogs like this is to increase the impulse control and the level of compliance with the handler. All right guys, so I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I like being honest with you guys. I like sharing everything with you guys, the good, the bad, the ugly. You know, every, uh, everybody that does this type of work has good, bad, and ugly. Nobody has all good. Uh, and what we try to learn from the bad and the ugly is, is how to be better next time, maybe how to avoid the situation next time, um, or even if there's no avoiding the situation, just getting better for next time or, or being more prepared for next time. Um, but thanks guys for watching, like, subscribe, comment below, and uh, I'll see you on the next one.